What's going on, podcast listeners? My name is Michael Chernow. I am a restaurateur and lifestyle entrepreneur, and I am truly obsessed with living a life better than yesterday through wellness, fitness, and good vibes. I've always wondered if the drive to succeed is something we are born with or if it's something that is made over time through grit, drive, and perseverance. I get to answer that question exactly, and the goal of this podcast is to talk with people that have absolutely crushed it in life and have inspired me to do the same. This is Born or Made. What's going on, guys? Welcome back to the Born or Made podcast. I am very excited to introduce a guest, a guy that I look up to, a guy that has done something really, really disruptive. Um, he is this, the co-founder and CEO of Thrive Market. His name is Nick Green. Um, he is a serious entrepreneur. He's been doing this since he graduated college or actually i think he launched a business right out of his college dorm i mean you know like the story of launching a uh disruptive business out of your harvard college dorm is not like the most abnormal thing to hear so let's just call a spade a spade here <laughs> but uh nick is nick is um really done something special uh with thrive market um impacting families around the country in a real way one of the coolest things i think thrive market does is for every paid member uh, for Thrive Market, there is a free membership given to a low in, lower income family, which I think is wonderful. And I think you know one of the one of the challenges that we face in the world today, but also in the United States in a real way, is um, is nutrition and and people in lower income regions and smaller communities around the country not having access. Um, and that's a real problem, right? Like we have an, we have a obesity epidemic and it's because we just simply don't have access. There's the, the access to the stuff is not there. So Nick, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me. Really excited to be here. Um, I'll give you the skinny real quick on how this thing goes. We, the, the podcast is called Born or Made. Uh, it's a really fun conversation. I really want to get your story. Uh, and, and, and I ask you the question now that we'll answer at the end of the podcast but do you believe you were born with an inherent ability to crush it in life the way you have, or if you were made over time through grit, grind, and hustle? Now, I know what you're thinking, and I'm gonna probably you know, give, you the, give you the get out of jail free card, because it's probably a combination of the two. However, let's try to get there through your story. So ideally, you're taking us back um, so we can get to, get to know you a little bit better. Uh, so we can understand what drives you, man. What, 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 what was it that, that motivated you to be the guy you are today? Uh, that's a, that's a big question. Um, you know, literally I could spend the entire rest of the conversation just, just pondering that question. And the truth is, you know, I don't know the exact answer to that any more than anyone else does. And, you know, I was sort of dreading when you asked the border made question, because, I think it's both. It might be one or the other. I don't even know which one it is. And that's, that's the honest truth because there's, there's so much tangled in the, in, in the background. Um, but I, you know, I do think there are, I don't think that I have a talent or a, you know, skill or an intelligence or an entrepreneurial ability that's unique. I do think there are certain kind of innate interests and passions that, you know, were spawned through, uh, through experience that definitely, you know, snowballed into where I've been. And for me, you know, the kind of roots of my entrepreneurial journey started super, super early. Like my two companies that I've started, one was in education and one is in health and wellness and food. And both of those really come from uh, my own childhood. And frankly, my mom, whose two passions and two commitments to her family and to her kids uh, were around education uh, and food. And, and then that in turn came from her own experience growing up. So my mom was uh, you know, second generation Mexican American, uh, was the first of her family to attend any college. Uh, she didn't graduate, but she at least got, got there and, uh, and was the only one of, I think most of the people in her family who didn't have some of those lifestyle diseases you were referring to, type two diabetes, issues, issues with obesity. Um, and so, you know, it was sort of ingrained in her and, and her, her mission personally, and then for her family was to, um, you know, get better education for her kids and also make sure we were growing up really healthy. And, 
you know, this was in middle class middle America back in the 80s and 90s. I grew up in Minnesota. And, you know, what that meant was like going to a good public school. My mom opened and enrolled for us to go to a Spanish immersion school so we could learn Spanish, uh, which is, you know, important for her, for her family history. Um, and it meant also like spending a little more on groceries and, uh, you know, hunting around to find good spots. There weren't, wasn't a whole foods in the neighborhood. Uh, but my mom was that like, you know, weird mom that didn't have any sugared cereal and was focused on buying organic and like thinking about the GMO issue before anyone knew what that acronym even meant. And so I had baked into me pretty early that, you know, health and education were really fundamental. And uh, my first company started when I got to college and, and realized that, you know, the advantages that kids had who were going to, you know, private schools or, or, uh, or boarding schools and like, you know, essentially going to college and high school, mm -hmm. um, getting SAT prep starting in like eighth grade, um, you know, just like didn't resonate with, with my experience at all. And so my first company was trying to level that playing field and uh and make college more accessible it's called ivy insiders and we basically took undergrads from places like harvard and sent them back to their hometowns to do sat courses uh, at a third the price of kaplan and princeton review so that anyone could take them um, and then similar to our free memberships model at thrive anyone that couldn't afford could just come in and do it for free um so you know I don't know if you want to like born or made. I don't know what, what, what the answer is there, but that was totally from my experience and from kind of, you know, more from my passions than it was because I was, you know, super talented as an entrepreneur. I kind of describe it as being an entrepreneur or an accidental entrepreneur. Um, and then with Thrive, you know, it, it, it was after I sold that first company that I uh, more or less stumbled into Thrive as well. And, you know, literally I, I'd been doing some angel investing out in LA. I was in the middle of an earnout uh, after selling the first first company, and um, and met my co-founder Gennar, who pitched me on investing. And I had probably seen 500 investment pitches over the over the course course of the last prior six months before we met. And um, you know, had invested in maybe a dozen different startups. Never even contemplated wanting to join one. And Gennar was pitching me on an idea that didn't exist, but the mission was exactly what it is today. It's make healthy living easy and affordable for everyone. And I was like, you know, that is amazing. And mm. so again, it like resonated at a deep level, you know, probably partially from my experience, but probably partially from just like, you know, something that I could get behind and seemed impactful and was just like, you know, innately passionate about. Um, so by the end of that meeting, I was pitching him on doing it together. Um, and it's been, you know, a longer journey, uh, a more up and down journey than the first business. Uh, but just an incredible life dream and, and to now, you know, be where we're at with a million plus paid members, hundreds of thousands of, of low income families who are also getting access to the platform, um, you know, scale where we're starting to impact supply chains and really you know, make a difference on the environmental front. Uh, it's just been it's been absolutely amazing. What, a, what an incredible story, man. You know, I love the fact that you were influenced by your mom. And I'm sure that that was not something that you intentionally did. But it's so interesting that your mom's two pillars were education and food. And you ultimately launched two successful businesses, starting one with education and now, now in food. You know, when I say inherent, I think that there's something inherent there, right? Like, there's got to be, you know, some subconscious uh, gravitational pull towards those two things for you. Um, you know, and when I sit and I listen to you, it's so you're so articulate and clear about how you sort of define your story. What it made me think of was, you know, you said you didn't really have a unique talent or a potential skill set as far as entrepreneurs is concerned. But what I do think you have, I, I probably disagree with you, um, but but what I do think you certainly do have um, is um, the way you think. I think I believe that that is what distinguishes an entrepreneur from someone who's more comfortable working for others is, you know, when you when you think about something that you feel needs solution or needs help, it's probably and you fixate on it because you genuinely believe in it and it and it touches a, you know, a passion of yours. I at least I know for me, it's almost impossible to talk me off the, the ledge right like I you know, if there's something that I believe in, that I know that there could potentially be a solution for that's not done or not done well, and I could potentially launch something or be a part of something that could help that, I'm jumping, man. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm jumping, and I don't, I don't, I don't really care if there's a patch of jellyfish in the water below. Like I'm just gonna go um, and do it, and I think that we share that similarity. 
Uh, 100%. So, I mean, the way I would describe it is like, if I have anything that's unique, it's like one, a really uh, sort of open-minded mentality. Like I'm always looking for opportunities. I'm looking for problems. You know, if I see that dollar bill on the ground, I don't take for, I like, I'll pick it up, you know? Like I don't take for granted that like the world is efficient, that every problem has been solved. Um, and, uh, and then I would combine that with like, sort of what you're saying, like that, like dog on a bone obsession. Like once I find a problem that really engages me and that I'm passionate about, I'm just like on it. And, you know, on things that I don't care about, I'll tell you, I am, I am incompetent. I can't stay focused. I've like, like I literally have ADD. Um, so, you know, it's, it's not that I'm, uh, it's not that I had this incredible execution ability, but when the give a shit factor is really, really high, um, then I'm like, I'm like that dog on the bone. I just won't let go. The give a shit factor. I'm with, I'm with the give a shit factor. I'm building a business right now where I really give a shit. And, um, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting. I've, I've built a, I've built a number of businesses myself and exited a few of them. And, um, every single time I I'm in the position that I'm in right now, which is just sort of the early days development building sort of, you know, pouring the foundation, it always feels new. It always feels, it feels, you know, like I'm, like I'm winging it. Um, because there's, I there's, there's nothing, there's nothing like it, right. It's that moment of possibility. Like your, 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 your creative juices are flowing. The energy's up, you know, you wake up in the morning, like can't sleep anymore. You got to get out of bed and get started. Totally. And you, and like, uh, maybe you like open your eyes up in the middle of the night and you thought about that one thing and it's, and it's so hard to go back to sleep. And I had that last night, literally I had it last night. I woke, I opened up my eyes at like three o'clock in the morning. My younger son also happened to be sleeping in bed next to me, which is not a regular occurrence, but, uh, yeah, that that moment where you're just like, ugh, and you just think about it, and it's hard to get back down. Um, I, I have a few questions because um, you're you're at the precipice of something really special. I, I think that healthy living, wellness is obviously in the spotlight right now, and I, I, I and I don't think it just started, but it's pretty it's pretty cutting edge for the majority of the people in the world, right? Um, what are you noticing in the pandemic? Um, are, are people leaning more towards the, like, what are people leaning towards in terms of their purchasing behavior in a time like this? Yeah. I mean, you can look like at different points in the pandemic, you know, there's, there was weird distortion that happened, right? Like you had like two weeks where everyone was hoarding toilet paper, right? We sold through six months of toilet paper in six days. Mm. Uh, you had like the hand sanitizer craze and like, we couldn't keep hand sanitizer in stock. You know, when things were ramping up on the lockdowns, you had people that were, you know, basically bunker building. So like getting canned foods and like anything with long shelf life. Um, so there's definitely been all of that stuff, which I think is like kind of left turns from where like the trends were going. But I also think there's been a massive like acceleration basically of secular trends that were already happening and that maybe people weren't noticing as much. But once they got going at, you know, 5x speed, everyone's like, holy cow. And, you know, example of that is just the shift of grocery online. You know, I think a lot of media coverage during the pandemic is as if grocery shopping online just started in 2020. Right, um, right. And the truth is, it's actually been an exponential growth curve for the last decade. It's just been at that early stage and it's just inflecting. And then it just, you know, obviously it, it turbocharged during the pandemic. Um, but another one, and like, this is actually the trend that we're betting on most at Thrive is around, is around the focus on health and wellness. And just this awakening among people all across the country from all walks of life, all different income levels, like just, you know, totally different backgrounds who are all converging on this idea of wanting to be healthy. And, you know, I think when, you know, 20 years ago, it was kind of a coastal phenomenon, right? It was like LA, New York, San Francisco, affluent people. And I'll tell you, even five or six years ago, when we were first fundraising for Thrive, we got rejected by 50 plus VCs who didn't think that middle-class middle America wanted to get healthy, right? Like their image was, was sort of like what it was when I was growing up, where like my mom was like the weird mom on the block who was into being healthy and no one else was really thinking about it. But I think that's totally changed. And I think Thrive has proven that. Like that's been kind of the ultimate vindication is to see that 50% of our membership base is in the Midwest and the Southeast. You know, average household income is $75,000. Uh, we've got as many people over the age of 50 as under the age of 30. 
And so there is this broad coalition of, you know, what I call conscious consumers um, that is still small, but it's just, get, it's like that snowball is going and it's going and it's going. And I think it is, uh, it's not only really about the health of individuals, it's also people thinking about the health of their communities, right? It's also people thinking about the health of the planet. And that's why I say it's like a, it's a consciousness that is changing for people of all walks of life. And, you know, that's what we're trying to be positioned to do at Thrive is be there for those people, be that trusted platform where they're going to find the products that are healthy, where they're going to be able to search by the diets and values that they care about. And where they're also going to be able to feel good that when they shop on Thrive, you know, their membership supports a membership for low-income family. You know, the supply chains that we're building are fair trade. They're regenerative. They're organic. They're doing, they're doing things the right way. Um, you know, I like to think about it as, as you know, shopping you know, as, as sort of a political action in a way, right? It's like you're voting with your dollars totally. and what you buy has significance. It's, it's obviously what you're going to consume. It has significance for your own body but it also has significance for your family, for your community and for, for the planet. And I think more and more uh, people are thinking that way. And I don't think it's gotten a ton of attention, but I think the pandemic accelerated that too. You know, I think so many people were sitting at home and feeling kind of helpless, right? It's like, how can I make, how, how can I make an impact? And obviously a lot of people were also really scared. So, you know, from that standpoint, everyone's focused internally on their health and hyper aware of their vulnerability. Um, and, you know, many of those lifestyle diseases we talked about earlier are comorbidities for COVID. So if you have type two diabetes or you're, you're obese, you know, you, you got a much higher risk. So I think people were all of a sudden concerned with that, but they also wanted to be part of the solution, right? They wanted to know how can I make a difference? How can I help? What can I do from my house under lockdown to help the first responders and the healthcare workers that are out there, you know, on the front, on the front lines uh, to help families that are directly affected. You know, one of the coolest things we saw in the pandemic was actually on site, we have this tool that you can donate at checkout. Um, and historically, what we do is we let people donate a portion of their savings on that order to our Gives members. So those are to our free members. And during the pandemic, we basically diverted that to be still towards Gives members, but towards families that are directly affected by COVID-19 and towards uh, healthcare workers that we gave free memberships to. Um, and we saw our donation rate spike 9x. We raised a million and a half dollars uh, in about five months. Wow. And it was just like this outpouring of generosity. And I was like, wow, this is conscious consumers unleashed. And again, I think people are like, it's in the zeitgeist, people are aware of it, but I think there's something really powerful happening there. And it's super exciting because it's not only the chance to change health outcomes, it's also the chance to start impacting things like climate change. Um, and, uh, and I think it's, uh, you know, I think it's, it's, potentially one of those silver linings in the pandemic where like, I think that trend got accelerated. I'm so happy you said that because, you know, I, I, I think we're talking about, you know, physical health and wellness. Um, but something that I think has also been accelerated is the necessity for solution in mental health uh, in the pandemic, right? And, um, and I, you know, I, <laughs> you know, locking up a country is really, it's, 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 it's a tough thing to do without, without thinking that there's going to be some, some mental health ramifications. One thing that I know for sure, um, for me and sort of the community that I associate with, um, in, in a number of different arenas is, um, nutrition is a win. You know, what you put into your body, if you're putting good things into your body, it's a win, a big fat win. And, you know, we as human beings really do like to win. Um, but it's, it, 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 and I don't mean win in the sense of like winning the battle. I mean, win like if you can drop seeds throughout your day that make you feel good about yourself, um, th that is at a, that is at that, that need is at an all time high, right? Like it's, it's a feed, it's a feedback loop, right? Like all our entire lives are these feedback loops. And like, you know, a healthy decision here starts your day off right and like helps you to make a better decision there. And then like that compounds to the next step, the next step. And, you know, the truth is physiologically putting good food in your body. Also, like your mind is part of your body. Your brain is, your brain is part of your body. Like those systems are all connected totally. and, you know, it is, uh, you know, they all, it all goes together. Let's talk about habits um, because a lot of my habits actually revolve around uh, food and what I, what I put into my body. Um, but 
I would love to hear if you have a morning routine or if you have some habits that you've implemented into your life that you stick to on a consistent basis that make you the best version of yourself. I'd love you to share those with us. I mean, look, I don't have it. There's no secret, right? To, if you're trying to do something big and important, it's just hard work and it takes tenacity and perseverance. So I don't want to say I have like some magic formula that is how I you know, get 10 times more done than anyone else in a day. Um, I have huge parts of my day, you know, most days that are really inefficient. Um, but I am a big fan of habits. And the main reason I am is that it, like, I think about it as kind of uh, a reduction in my, in the need for cognitive bandwidth towards things. Like the fewer decisions I can make, the more I can have just kind of like scheduled out, the easier it is. And so I do that with food, you know, in terms of like what I'm going to have for breakfast every morning. I do that with like my caffeine intake. You know, I just like, I never have more than that one glass. Uh, and, and I do that with my exercise too. So I, I get my exercise done at the very beginning of the day. Um, you know, I've got two kids at home. So there's always that like X factor of unpredictability. You know, the, the three-year-old's gonna end up in bed with us or whatever, but, <laughs> uh, but you know, notwithstanding some major interruption, you know, I, I get up at the same time, like 6.30 or so. Um, I don't do super intense exercise. Like it's, it's interesting how my workouts have changed over the last 10 years. Uh, at one time it was, I think a little more vanity driven. Now I've kind of accepted my destiny as a skinny guy. And like, I'm just trying to stay healthy and, and, you know, I want to be like old and, and still physically active with my kids someday. Um, so, um, you know, mostly I'm doing either stationary bike on the kind of non-workout days or I'm going for a good run and usually doing intervals. Um, I've got a pull-up bar, put, you know, um, sort of perfect push-up stuff that I do throughout the day just to kind of keep myself, uh, keep myself going. Um, and then I've got, uh, I've got a stand-up desk with a, a stool that like is on a swivel, basically. So I never sit on something that has a back because I find myself slouching. Mm. So I try to kind of build, like I've got my morning routine, which is like, you know, work out, have my, have my cup of coffee, don't eat anything until 10 a.m. Try to, you know, I'm not doing intermittent fasting really, but shorten that feeding window a bit. Um, and then I try to basically have things sort of in the way throughout the day that force me to, to, to move a little bit. Um, and honestly, like just like a little bit of motion, a walk outdoors at lunch for me are some of the ways that I like break up the day and, and get myself better focus. Um, and then I'd say one other habit that I have, which is maybe, you know, an old habit that's died hard is I'm a bit of a night owl. Um, now I don't stay up as late as I used to, like literally I used to work, like I get my most productive time between like 11 PM and 2 AM. Uh, again, with kids, I can't do that, but I'm basically back online. And I would say doing my, probably my most productive work for, between like 8 30 PM and 10 30 PM. And I know like all the research that says you shouldn't have your mind active at the end of the night, don't be in front of a screen, all of that. For whatever reason, for me, like I feel so good after cranking for two hours uh, right before I go to bed. Is, are you married? I am. Does your partner give you shit for that? Uh, not at this point. Uh, we've been together for so long. She kind of, you know, she know she knew what she was getting into. She knows my idiosyncrasies and she, uh, she kind of accepts it, but uh, there's definitely some sacrifice and the compromise that we've made because, you know, in her mind too, it's like, hey, that end of the night time should also be time for us, um, which doesn't end up working out because she goes to bed before when I'm like in the middle of my groove. Mm -hmm. um, so we basically moved up that and like kids are in bed by 7.30 and 7, 7.30 to 8.30 is kind of the time for us. Um, yeah, I, uh, I remember when I started, when I launched um, my first business, and I just had zero control over stop and go like not there was no it was, it was like you know you know the drill it's one speed when you're getting going and you're a young entrepreneur just trying to crush it and so I worked you know I don't know 20 hours a day for three years straight without taking a day off and I my wife looked at me deadpan in the eyes and said you know I love you more than anything but I want to keep it that way like this can't go on forever. And, uh, you know, it gave, that was the first time I really sort of looked at the whole, um, I don't, I don't necessarily believe in work-life balance. I don't know if there is like really a solution there. I, I think, 
you know, if you're, if you're trying to balance out your work and your life, it's kind of got to be done on an annual basis or a quarterly basis. When you try to do it on a, on a, you know, daily or weekly or even monthly basis, it's just, it's really difficult, uh, you know, in our line of work, but um, yeah. I've given my evenings up. I really have, I've given up my evenings and it's been, uh, I think my wife is very happy about that for sure. Yeah. I think it's just, it's like finding what works for, for each person and for the relationship and like, you know, different partners are different too. Like there was a lot of years where my, my wife wasn't as understanding about it. And, you know, we've, we tried to, I've actually used kind of the habit habits and scheduling little blocks in as well to, to break it up. So for example, uh, this afternoon, actually right before we got on this, uh, this podcast, my wife and I went for a half hour walk. So we just like schedule that in it's 45 minutes in the middle of the day when I would normally do my lunch and we go for a walk together and that's been game changing, you know, and awesome. we, and during the course of a week when we may not see each other that much, it's, it's great. But, um, I also don't believe in work-life balance. And this is one thing that I do. I, I don't know if I'd say it's nature, but like for me, just innately, like when I'm going, I'm going, like, I don't want to stop for some other reason. And, you know, I, I'm intense, you know, it's like that obsessive, that obsessive personality. And I think there was periods in my twenties where I felt guilty about that, or I felt like I wanted to change. And there's, there's obviously it can become unhealthy. And if you're working 20 hours a day, like that's probably not sustainable. Yeah. But for me, like I can happily work for, you know, I don't know what it ends up being, but 12, 12 hours plus per day. And I can work on the weekend and I'm feeling pretty, feel pretty good. And so I think it is just a, I think it's a personal thing and finding kind of that, that balance that works for you. And, and like you said, like also making the compromises because when it comes to relationship, it's two people. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. I think, I think, you know, you make a good point that, you know, it, it, it's certainly a personal thing. I also think it's a situational thing, right? Like depending on what your, your partner, if you have a partner, like what that person is willing to withstand and potentially that person's also, you know, a killer too. Right. So, you know, if, the, if my wife, you know, she, she worked her, ass off when we first met and uh and and she, you know she basically was the breadwinner for a while and then when we had our kids she just you know we made a decision that she was going to stop working and so now she now she doesn't and she definitely wants me <laughs> wants me uh, uh at attention at uh eight o'clock at night after the kids are down um success man what what is that what does that mean to you uh well, I'm going to tie this back to nature versus nurture again, because one thing I would say about myself is I'm a goal oriented person and like success, you know, for me is you, you said the word winning, like I totally relate to that. Like I'm competitive as all hell. I, you know, both internally competitive and externally competitive. And so, you know, I do like playing games that are where I'm like striving and growing and pushing and seeing how, how hard I can go. So the first thing I would say about success is I actually appreciate and value success for its, in its own, like for its, in its own right, for in and of itself, just like the process of winning, of doing something exceptionally well and getting better, I love. And like, that's as true for me in like playing a board game, you know, or like playing cards as it is with, you know, building a business. And, you know, I would say that's another thing that I, that in the past I had probably like, I used to feel kind of guilty about, or like, I thought I shouldn't be so competitive or gosh, like, you know, it shouldn't bother me when I lose in a, a you know stupid game of chess or whatever, but it's just the way I am. It's the way I'm wired. And actually accepting that has been, uh, has been really uh, sort of relieving and freeing to express that part of me that like, I'm someone that likes to play games and I like to win. Um, but I think one of the, one of the lessons that I've learned over time is also how to channel that motivation and that goal orientation towards things that are aligned with my values. So, you know, like winning in games that don't matter is like, great, I get that little sugar high of winning, but to what end? And as I've gotten older and especially in my entrepreneurial journey and especially looking at like this business versus the first business, you know, I'm thinking on a longer time scale. I'm thinking in terms of bigger ambitions of impact um, and, and increasingly I'm thinking more and more externally, right? Like I think, uh, you know, in my twenties, I was one of those guys who was reading a lot of self-help books and, you know, undoing a lot of the bad learnings that I probably developed as a, as a kid. And, uh, and it was really valuable, but as I've gotten older, so much more of my orientation is, is external and, you know, having kids was a big step 
there where like it just all of a sudden you have this human in your life that you care about more than you even care about yourself. You know, that's a pretty profound experience. Um, and then starting Thrive was a really profound experience and seeing, uh, you know, truly having a mission driven business where like, you know, both my co-founder and I had started and sold businesses. We didn't need to start another business to put bread on the table. We started the business because we wanted to, you know, put bread on every table in America and think about how we could have maximum impact. And that has been the Nirvana kind of thing for me is channeling my competitive energy, channeling that intensity, you know, channeling even some of that like insecurity that like that chip on the shoulder that, you know, questioning of myself, of, like, am I good enough and putting it towards something that isn't just internally driven, but is really like having impact in the world. Um, and I think that's, uh, you know, that's maybe that blend of, of nature and nurture. It's like, if you've got that competitive nature, channel it towards something that, you know, out in the world is going to actually make a difference. And that's been ultimately super fulfilling. Um, I love that, that you brought up, um, the little voice that says, you know, you're not good enough. And, uh, you know, we've all I'm, got it. We've all, we've all got it. And fear is something, uh, fear separates. It's the old, it's the ultimate sort of divide division of, of humans. I believe there are people that can withstand high levels of fear and anxiety and stress. And there are those that can simply cannot and don't want to, right? Um, I think we're probably cut from similar silk in, in regards to the, the, the fear threshold. Um, but I love that you bring it up, that the voice, because the voice is a real thing. Um, and the voice, is, you know, fear manifests itself for me in that, in that way, right? Where there's just, and, and, and I think I've, I've gotten much better at, at sort of quieting that voice or embracing the voice um, uh, and not really paying too much attention to it only because I know it's not real. It's my ego, it's, but I mean, it's does, so interesting. To, go ahead. Yeah, go no, ahead. no, no, go ahead. I was please. gonna say, it's so interesting that you said embracing the voice. Cause for me, the biggest thing has been not fighting it, not pushing back. I mean, I've said this a few times already, but like I spent a lot of my life, like wishing that I might be a little bit different you know, and like, like, I shouldn't be like this, or I shouldn't be like that, or I ought to do this. And then like fighting my own nature. And the greatest release for me of like energy and potential was just like embracing it. Like, Hey, this is the way, the way that I am. Yes. I have that little insecure in my voice. It's running all the time telling me what I didn't do right. What I should have done differently, you know, where I'm inadequate. Like I am so hyper attuned every you know, as critical as I can be on anything externally, I'm 10 times more critical internally. And, you know, I don't know to what extent everyone has that. I know I have it. And I know that the more I fought that, the like louder the voice became. And like the ultimate irony is like, as soon as I sort of accepted that it was there and then realized to your point that you can like, you can basically act anyway, right? Like you're afraid, you're afraid of that voice. It's telling you not to do it. It's like jump in the deep end anyway and see what happens. And the more you sort of like flex that muscle, um, I can't remember where the, where the quote's from. It's super cliche, but that idea that you know courage isn't the absence of fear; it's it's having fear but acting anyway. Mm -hmm. And I mean that's so true. And the more you do it, you realize like, oh, I guess there was nothing to be afraid of. Like, oh, that, you know, everything I was afraid of happened, and it wasn't so bad, right? It was worse to like sit there cowering and and not not acting, right? The rejection didn't matter. And like over time, you sort of uh, like the way the comparison I sometimes give is that like, I feel like we're like life today is like a video game where you have infinite lives, you know, like in our hunter gatherer days, you know, back in the, our evolutionary history, like you make a wrong move, you're killed by a saber tooth tiger. <laughs> like today, like you make a wrong move, like who cares? Like get up and try again. Like, you know, we've all had tons and tons of failures and like, you know, I, I used to say in my first business, I failed my way to success, but I, I actually feel like it's been that way in basically everything. It's like, it's trial and error, it's iterative. And, um, and so, yeah, I'm kind of riffing here, but just every, what you said about embracing that insecurity and not, and like sort of realizing, all right, I can have that. And it's like the, the voice in my head and I can still make a decision irrespective of what that voice is saying. And the more you do that, that it like proves that the voice isn't it's not real. It's just like a, it's an artifact. You know, people, I think the question that I get asked most, um, or one of the questions that I get asked most is like, how do you start? 
I want to do, I, I want to, but you know, how, Mike, can you give me some advice on how to start? My answer is, 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 you know, and it's taken me a little time to get to this, but I think it's actually my authentic truth here. When I think about how to start, it, it, it doesn't really, uh, for me, it doesn't really start within the specific genre of what people are trying to do, right? Like if I'm like, oh, I want to, I want to launch a, you know, I want to open a restaurant, Mike, you know, you've opened up a bunch of restaurants. How do I do it? Or I want to launch a, a product or, I, you know, for me, for those that are just like, you know, really trying to navigate the waters, it really starts with, with structure and like, and like little small decisions that are done consistently to build up enough strength and confidence to be able to face fear at face value, right? Like to literally be able to say, okay, I know that I can make these small little decisions. And like we, we talked about it, it's as simple as waking up at a similar time, put, making fitness a priority, nutrition a priority in your life, telling your wife you love her and going out for a 45 minute walk, like those little things strung together, um, done on a consistent basis, give us the fuel to ultimately ignite a fire that's way bigger than we could have ever imagined. And I, I would ask you for those that are listening to give some advice on the starting point, how, you know, I mean, I know that I gave my answer first because I feel so strongly about that. Um, and that's why, you know, habits are such a big part of my life. But if you could give a little piece of advice on someone listening that wants to get started um, on building a business. I mean, I, I agree with everything you're saying. And I think that people, you know, our minds naturally think of things in a linear way, but reality and nature and anything that isn't like in a textbook is always going to be, it's going to have non-linearities and cumulative dynamics and things compound. And I think, I mean, this sounds very academic, but like our minds balk at understanding that. And, you know, a really like simple expression of it is just momentum, right? Like momentum exists in everything. And if you start like that first step is the hardest, the second step's a little easier. The third step's a little easier than that. And each one's not independent of the other. It builds on the last. And every step that you take, you get a little bit stronger. And every you know, time you land on firm ground, you realize, all right, I didn't have anything to be afraid of. And so, you know, I think the, like, at the risk of seeming like really inane, the, the, you know, the answer to the question is kind of the question itself, like, just start, just like do something, take action, move forward. And the only kind of caveat I would put to that is like, don't do something that's going to get you killed, right? Like, you know, <laughs> like, if, if you, and I'm not saying that literally, but like, to go back to the evolutionary example, like, if you live in an environment of evolutionary adaptation, we had to be really scared little creatures because we were like fragile and like you make wrong, one, one wrong step and like you fall off a cliff, or you get eaten by a, by a bear, or like, you know, your family starves. There was high risk. That's what our mind has evolved to deal with. And that's why we're like always on a hair trigger for risk. And that's why we're all like hardwired to be afraid all of the time. And, you know, I would say just as kind of a bit of a digression, people are very different on the spectrum in that regard. Like there are people that objectively just like feel less fear. Um, but what, I, what I'll say for whatever it's worth, I'm definitely not one of those people. Like I have a, I'm on a heart hair trigger. Like I'm thinking about everything that can go wrong. And I think a lot of people are. Um, but again, we live in an environment where for the most part, there aren't a lot of things that can go wrong. Now, you know, if you're gonna start a restaurant and you take out a second mortgage on your house and quit your job and like go into credit card debt, you know, you're taking real risk and you got to think about what the consequences are, the, of, uh, are of there. But there are so many little things you can do in many cases before you like fully jump off the edge. And, you know, for me and both of my businesses, you know, they like, I started my first business just teaching SAT classes myself. Right. And like, it started like at first, it was just like tutoring a small group of kids. Then it was teaching a few more kids. Then the next summer I ran multiple classes. And the next summer I brought on more, more instructors. Then the next summer I hired for more colleges. And then all of a sudden I had a multi-million dollar business that I you know, sold when I was in my mid twenties. When I was 17 and I started that business, I wasn't like, I'm going to, you know, at 25, I want to sell this business for X dollars. No way. I didn't even like dream of that. I just took a step forward and then adjusted. And, you know, you have at every step, you have optionality at every step, 
whether you make a mistake or not, you're going to learn something. And often you make, you learn the most from those mistakes. And so, you know, the key is like, you got to take steps. You got to be intellectually honest. You got to be like, when you make a mistake, you can't put your head in the sand and say, you know, not admit it, at least not admit it. You, you can, maybe don't have to admit it to everyone else, but you got to be able to admit it to yourself. And, you know, again, if I were to like kind of point to things that have helped me, like it's not being smarter than other, than, than other people. Like I can tell you, like having taught the SAT, like you can make someone good at tests. You can make someone good at academics. It's, it's just the, it's the willingness to get out, make mistakes and learn from those. And it's cumulative and it compounds. Um, I agree with you. I, I wholeheartedly agree with you. Um, when, when, when starting a business, do you think that there needs to be uh, a sort of equilibrium of offense and defense? Or do you think it's more of an offensive play or more of a defensive play? Uh, I think you got it like, you have to be intellectually honest. So if you are you can't be drinking your own Kool-Aid so much that you're being foolish. Um, I actually think that like most people are not at risk of that. Again, there are some people that like actually are just like natural risk takers. If you're one of those people, you probably know it and you gotta be like, you know, you gotta hold back and like probably play some defense. For most of us, we're way too defensive just to begin with in, in every sense of the word. And so we have to basically you know, we have to counter that by deliberately saying, I'm going to play offense. I'm going to take more risks than I'm comfortable with. I'm going to get outside my comfort zone. Um, and, you know, for, at least for me, like I'm never at risk of being like foolhardy, right? Like I grew up, like when we go to a restaurant, like looking on the menu, I would like, you know, my, man, my parents did this too. We'd like, look at what were the most expensive things and what were the cheap things and like, Oh, is it worth two more dollars to get cheese on this hamburger or whatever? Um, so like, I'm never at risk of like throwing my fortune into a, into a wild investment. Um, and I think, you know, most people are pretty risk averse. So my advice to most people would be, be more willing to like take risks, to put things out there and to learn from them. But again, you have to hedge against the catastrophic risk. So like, don't bet the farm is the basic thing, right? Like if like, I go back to that video game analogy, like if you know that like this move could like, wipe out all of your lives like don't make you know don't make that move unless you're really really certain but everything else you know you just like you just like stumble through it and and i think the most important thing for people to to realize is you know there is no like if you look at people that have been successful and i've spent a lot of time doing this by the way like one of my my early paths to trying to be successful was reading biography so that i could like you know, mirror what, you know, mirror what a great person who, did. Who are you, I, I got to ask, like, who are your muses in that? In I that? mean, I was like, uh, I read all the Industrial Titans biographies, Rockefeller, Vanderbilt, Carnegie, um, you know, military geniuses like Napoleon. I mean, just like, you know, a lot, lot of, a lot of historical stuff, uh, more so than like present day, but I've also read like, you know, Shoe Dog was a really cool one about, you know, Phil Knight's journey with Nike. Um, and what I found out is that those are really inspiring, but you're never going to get the playbook. And the biggest thing I learned, especially from some of those bigger, denser biographies, is like a lot of these guys' lives, they were just like, you know, they were screwing things up all the time. It was yeah, like there was mistakes, totally. there was setbacks, there was victories, there was losses. And, you know, and some of them had catastrophic losses at different, at different points. Um, so to me, that was the, the really encouraging thing is to see like, if you want to be successful, put your eye on what success means and then just like try to find the best way that you can there. There's not going to be any roadmap that like takes you straight through there without any failure or pain or suffering because if that existed, everyone would be on the, you know, would be on the rainbow road. It's just not there. A quote that I, I coined myself that I, I believe to be, could be one of the most real things I've ever said was, uh, you know, you got to learn to love the heart and the hurt. You just have to learn to love it. It's just it, there. It's not going anywhere. It's real. It exists. And uh, if you want to, if you want to be, um, you know, if you have aspirations to be, to, to make an impact, um, the heart and the hurt or something that you're just gonna have to learn to love, right? You can't just like, like it, you know, you, you got to like when it, you know, because it's there all the time. 
there's it's never what you said about it's what you said about the voice right you got to embrace it it's not enough to just like tolerate it you actually have to embrace it you know ray dalio the founder of bridgewater one of the largest hedge funds in the world um he talks about reinterpreting pain as this like signal to learn and he says over time i started to realize that the most painful experiences were actually the ones that i learned the most and he's like, I know this will sound masochistic, but I started to like that pain. Like I liked that like ego breakdown. Mm -hmm. And as a result, like, you know, you do that enough and you, you uh, like you rewire your brain to say, okay, this bad thing happened. What can I learn from it? And so this bad things happened, you know, my life is, is, is terrible and I'm worthless. And like, I need to like block it out and like bury it somewhere in the recesses of my brain or whatever most people do. Well, I mean, when you really break it down and peel back the onion a little bit and think about like, any massive feat, right? You know, I always use an analogy, you think about a mountain and, you know, the climb, God knows the climb can take, you know, 100 X as long, 1,000, 2,000, 10,000 X the amount of time as, it, as you hang out on the peak for, right? Like you're on the peak and you like high five with your buddy or your friend, you know what I mean? And, and you take in the sights, and then you walk back down only to be faced with another uphill journey, you know? And so the embracing of that, the learning to love that, the journey component, the pieces that, of, 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 uh, that you can stick into your pack and into your pockets while you're walking up that hill, up that mountain, um, that is for me where I learn. And I'm sure for you and, and for all the Titans that have walked, um, you know, before all of us, right? There's, I, I, I it, for people that are listening and, and thinking that it's, you know, every, you know, Nick has got all the answers, you know, we've all failed an enormous amount of times. And, and maybe those failures haven't been catastrophic enough to like sink the ship. But I know for me, there's just been, I've learned so much from the hardest parts of being a, an entrepreneur and a business owner and a father, the hardest parts, you know, um, is where I've done my learning as, as where the learning actually happens. Um, this has been a really, really incredible chat, man. Um, what were you just going to say? I was going to say, I love that metaphor of the mountain and I'll, I'll just say two quick things. One is like to extend it a little bit, uh, you know, when you look back and you remember that summiting the mountain, like you remember the summit, but the stories that you tell with your friends were about the different things that happened along the way. A hundred percent. And like, and when you're up on the summit, you find yourself thinking about like, you know, those different travails and that tricky crossing and whatever. And like, you know, that was one of the big things for my first business is like, I sold the business and then I was like, oh, you know, what now? And instead I was like wishing I was back in the trenches and I never would have imagined that that was going to be the case, but it totally was. Uh, and then the second thing I was going to say is uh, just for, for any of your listeners that are interested, there's an amazing, or I think amazing book uh, by a guy named David Brooks, um, who's a, uh, he's an editorial writer for the, uh, for the New York times. Uh, but it's called the second mountain uh, or the second, it's the second mountain or second summit or second peak, but look up David Brooks. And it's all about this idea that the first mountain you climb in your life is towards like towards self mastery. And then the second one is around like impact. And it's all about how that mountain is just, you know, not necessarily more, but, but, uh, but fulfilling in a different way than the first mountain. And I found that metaphor to be super powerful in my own life, just thinking about what motivated me in my twenties and maybe early thirties and kind of what I want to be motivating me through the rest of my life. I love it, man. Um, I was going to ask you if you can give us a few books that you love that have potentially um, impacted you and influenced you along your journey. So that's one that I read relatively recently, the biographies, um, you know, find people that you admire and then read as much as you can about them. Again, not because you're going to get a playbook for success, but because you'll realize that the people that you admire most failed a lot. Um, it's like not what you think you get out of it, but it actually is the most valuable thing. Um, the, you know, one spiritual book that I, uh, that I read, um, I grew up Catholic, um, but I'm not practicing now, but uh, about five years ago, a friend of mine gave me a copy of the Tao Te Ching, mm -hmm. which is kind of an ancient Chinese, not really religious, but more philosophical text. Uh, that's actually the second most uh, wi like widely published book in the history of the world next to the Bible. Um, and unlike the Bible, it's about 70 pages. Each chapter is basically a poem that you can read in 45 seconds. 
Um, and it is like the, the first time you read it, you'll either think this is the most profound thing I've ever read, or I have no idea what the hell it's talking about. But if you spend some time with it, um, there's a lot of truth in there. And that's, that's my one source of daily reading. Um, and then the other thing I would say from a reading standpoint, um, uh, there's so much we learn from fiction, just about people. And, uh, and I, I, for through like my twenties, read a lot of, a lot of nonfiction. I actually now probably, you know, 60 to 70% of what I read is, is, is novels. And That's most amazing. I'm, I'm trying my best. I, I'm, I really, cause I, 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 I can't get away from nonfiction for whatever reason. I feel like I need to consume, uh, you know, like, I don't want to say like qualitative stuff, but you know, for me, like if I walk away with something that I can apply, um, I feel, I feel like not only is the reading something that I'm proud of, but, but then I can utilize it in my actual life. But here's, here's the reason that I moved away from a lot of nonfiction. Cause I, I'm, I'm wired the same way. I love getting like that, like that trick, that hack, that like application, um, but what I realized is that what I was actually getting from the books was the sense of accomplishment for having like finished, you know, gotten that hack or trick or, or application. Like I didn't, I didn't consistently feel like I was applying it. And actually one of the one, and this may, this may just be, this may be me or it may resonate with some people, but um, I've kind of like one filter I try to use now is like, is basically not looking for anything that has prescriptions like anything that's saying like to get here, you have to do this. Mm. Cause I just don't believe that's the way it works. I think, I think like the, like re if, if you believe that to get there, do this, and that helps you to actually get out and take that first step. Great. Then it's working. But like, there is no single path. And like, the only thing that matters is action and like being able to learn and adjust and like move along. And so that's why I say like from biography, get inspired, but don't try to like do the exact playbook. And like, there's so many books in the, especially in the self-help genre, which, which by the way, I spent a decade plus, you know, deep into, but like so many of them are like, you know, the recipe for happiness in life is one, two, three. Mm -hmm. And like, I will enjoy reading that because I get excited about that being the recipe for life, but like, that's not true, you know, <laughs> so Give us uh, a fiction book, man, or give me a fiction book because I'm trying to find a good story. I really, I, when I find a good one, I mean, like there's a book that stands out to me that I don't, I haven't read it in years, but there's a book called The Rule of the Bone. Did you ever read that book? No. Oh, you got to no. read that book, man. It's just, it's such a good story. I mean, it's so well written. And I think the beauty of fiction is being able to like really immerse yourself in, in, you know, I, I don't I say fantasy in the sense that like you can close your eyes and, and, and make your own sort of um, world around a book, right? Like around a story that, that actually didn't happen. So it's your opera, you have an opportunity to develop some creativity in what the scene could potentially look like. Um, totally. Any good, any good recs on the, on the fiction side? Uh, I mean, some that I, I really like the, the remains of the day. It's kind of a classic one. Uh, that I read a, a few years ago and really hit me. Um, the Razor's Edge is really good. Um, I recently, I'm just I'm close to finishing it, but I'm, I've am i been reading a trilogy by like a turn of the century American writer named uh, Theodore Dressier. I might be butchering his name, but he he wrote this trilogy called The Trilogy of Desire. And it's, uh, it's about the life of a, a financier uh, turned like, uh, kind of uh, streetcar titan, uh, railroad titan kind of kind of character, but it's like three ch three books and during three different periods of his life, and it's just like one. It's interesting because it's business, but business in a different time, which always gives you a different perspective. Mm. Of like, what was an entrepreneur like in the early twentieth century? But then it's just like amazing to be transported back a hundred plus years and see how much is the same, not just in business but in people. Um, so it's called the trilogy, tri trilogy of desire. The first one is the financier. The second one is the Titan. The third one is the, I think it's called the stoic. Um, and it's a commitment if you want to read them. Cause they're like, you know, it's probably 1200 pages total, but like I, I find them page turners. Nick, you're amazing, man. Thank you. This was such a fun convo. It's such a fun conversation to have. And, uh, I feel like I could probably talk to you for like seven more hours um so i really appreciate you taking the time with me today this is there's there's so 
so much value in uh, the stuff that you just said. And I'm sure a lot of people are going to be able to walk away from this podcast saying, thank gosh, I listened to that one. Um, so I really appreciate it. I've got to ask the question before we, uh, we wrap this up. Do you think you were born or made? <laughs> Um, I'm more confused after this interview than, than I was even when I started. <laughs> Honestly, both, neither, I, I, I have no idea, but I think I would say more made. I really do believe it's like, uh, it's, it's more about taking action and figuring it out than any sort of like innate talents or anything like that. Awesome, man. Well, where can we find you and how can people, if, they, if, they, if they're not on Thrive, can you give us some, some info on how people can follow along your journey and, and Thrive's journey? I mean, personally, I am completely off of social media. That should have been one of the habits that I that I that I suggested. Wow. Uh, again, no judgment, and I know for a lot of people, it's really helpful. For me, um, it's kryptonite. So uh, you won't find me anywhere. You'll find me in a in a book. Uh, and on Thrive, you know, we're on we're on Instagram. You can find us, you know, acro across social, and then uh, ThriveMarket.com uh, is where you can sign up for a membership. Uh, it's as as little as five dollars a month. Um, and you could basically make back the membership fee for the full year on two purchases. Uh, so all the best healthy essentials, 25 to 50% off. Nick, you're the man. Keep inspiring us, dude. You really, really are doing something special. And I just, I, I can only imagine what your ambitions are for this company. And I promise you with all of my heart that you're going to, you're going to get exactly what you want. I, I just, I just, uh, I know it, man. So thank you so much for doing what you do. Thanks for having me. This was super fun. Definitely off the beaten road in terms of topics. Uh, it's fun, fun to explore some of these inner, inner recesses, so to speak. Awesome, man. Thank you, brother. Cool. Thanks. All right.